Comcast. Son, the tar is rising. You've got to go. Yeah, it's rising, but couldn't they at least try to escape? In fact, their heads are both above ground level. So when the tar reaches this point, it will spread out onto more level land and only be up to their shoulders. There is no need for them to die here unless they are super determined to give Guy a traumatic backstory. Also, how did they even get into this tar pool? Did the tar sneak up on them? Or were they skinny dipping? If either of these things is true, then they deserve this ridiculous plot device, or I mean, death. Follow the light, and you'll find tomorrow. I assume the light that Guy's mom is referring to will be the sun? Now, if the sun is setting, Guy will find tomorrow, but probably not before he suffers a terrible death by exposure. Alternatively, if the sun is rising and he follows it, and depending on the time of year, there's a good chance he'll end up doubling back on himself and arriving right where he started. Great advice, Mom. It's been 14 moons since the mission began, following the light, but no sun of tomorrow yet. This right here demonstrates exactly why it is a piss poor idea to make a seemingly profound but honestly meaningless platitude the last words you share with your extremely young and impressionable child. Instead of sending him on a meaningless search for whatever the f tomorrow might be, give him some useful things like don't eat yellow snow or do not accept the part of the green lantern. Travelog, it's been 29 moons. There are at least 35 moons here. See, mom and dad, if you'd hung around instead of needlessly sacrificing yourselves to the tar gods, maybe your kid would have learned to count properly. Also, why is Guy only drawing crescent moons? If one moon equals one night, then he should have been able to capture the full range of moons in the lunar cycle. I know kids draw crescent moons as a default, but damn it, Guy. If you're going to keep a log that ignores the accepted stardate system, you damn well better replace it with something equally accurate. Also, also, narration. I did find this little fellow. He's all alone, just like me. There's another far darker story here about a cute furry strawberry dwelling critter that's ripped from its family by a selfish human boy and forced into a life of servitude. You know what? I think I would rather be watching that movie. Release the critter cut! He's a good lookout. I'm thinking of calling him... I know, I know, I'm supposed to approach this with some suspension of disbelief, that the characters have the same modern-day language that we use today, but I'm still gonna sin it. Travelogue. It's been... A lot of moons. All the moons. My thoughts after the first week of middle school gym class community showers somehow makes it into the script. Starting your movie with footage from the previous movie. What is this, a f***ing Rocky sequel? I see no reason why Eep did not crush Guy with that big rock. He doesn't identify himself or say anything. Maybe she sees his human arms. But considering she lives in a world with death cats, kangadillos, moon moths, punch monkeys, land sharks, wolf spiders, and a number of other giant insects, I don't think that Guy putting his hands up should have been enough to stop Eep from bashing his head in. Ah! Oops. Yeah, that was me. Hi, I'm Eep. Post-violence narration. In my defense, I had been living in a cave my whole life, and I didn't really come across other people very often, let alone a boy! Yes, because if there is one direction I was hoping they would go with this character in the sequel, it's even more boy crazy. And to think, the only two teenagers in the world, and we found each other. There are a million reasons why the concept of being a teenager should be completely foreign to Eep and Guy, but my pedantic ass is only concerned with the fact that the movie is set well before the invention of modern numerals. Also, this recap is making us think that the first meeting between Eep and Guy was a love at first sight situation. Now, <laughs> call me old fashioned, but attempted murder rarely does a good first date mate. I don't know what this feeling's called, but it looks like this. This symbolism suggests that Eep's understanding of emotion aligns with the modern context of love, which is absurd considering this takes place in the Paleolithic era. And we all know love feels like a trap. We've got some angry kangadillos on our tail! What? How did this make it into a kid's film? Oh, kangadillo. Character with no concept of what an automobile is uses this stick shift motion to encourage an equally vehicularly ignorant organism to accelerate. And it works! Belt? Seatbelt mode! Gah, seatbelts weren't even a thing until the mid-80s. And the casual anachronisms in this movie are officially starting to piss me off. Let's just add five sins for any others and end it! Boomsies? Boomsies. Acting like boomsies can be interpreted as anything other than a sex reference. <laughs> I still would have eaten that. He bit a butt. Butts are hilarious. He wants to eat the butt. Funniest thing ever. The writers of this movie, probably. The physics of this sleep pile is more complicated than the toilets on the space station. Also, the fact that any of these assholes are actually dozing right now is ridiculous. I don't care how long the sleep piles existed. I think Adele honestly said it best a few years ago. <clears throat> you really couldn't snooze rolling in the sleep. Maybe our tomorrow is different than the rest of, of the packs. Maybe our tomorrow is a place of our own, you know? Guy goes back and forth between describing tomorrow as a place sometimes and a concept other times. Tomorrow should be a metaphor to the audience at this point, but not Guy, especially since it's portrayed as a big breakthrough for his character later on in the film. Ooh, what's privacy? 
It means you only smell the feet you want to smell. Setting aside that he should probably adjust his privacy settings to not include smelling feet at all, technically he's defining autonomy. Privacy is the state of being unobserved, not the control of who's observing. It both amazes and terrifies me as to how these two Neanderthal assholes keep their teeth this white. Kill circle! This line of defense can in no way be described as a kill circle. Safety off, babe. Thanks. Movie thinks the only thing that stops a bad guy with a spear is a good guy with a spear. Also, every time this movie plays the look, they have the cave people version of modern stuff card, and they play it a lot. I just think about how this joke was already played out by the end of the Flintstones in 1966, over half a century ago. Also, also, the Kurds are shown to travel super light, so where are they keeping these weapons that they obviously made and even include features such as a safety? Hey everyone, you'll never guess what I found out! Grug survives this. You have to come see this! Follow me! You better come take a look at this cliché. Is that the only thing this accessory knows how to say? How the hell did Grug get to the other side of the wall so quickly? The rest of the pack was right behind him, so surely he couldn't have had time to climb over it. Ergo, there must be another way in. So why not take the pack through the mystery entrance instead of breaking down this excellent line of defense against tiger rafts, hyena gators, rhinoceros possums, or whatever else is likely to attack them? Movie believes that evolution would allow for a butterfly to be made out of watermelon slices. <laughs> Gluttony. Montaging with your mouthful. No, no. Hey, you got some minions in my crudes. Thank you, movie, for making me hate flip-flops and the stupid noise they make even more than I did before. Who knows what kind of weird, beyond-the-wall creatures they are. Jesus, it's like the village had sex with Game of Thrones and The Walking Dead and had a Trump-era immigration panic baby. We. Happy. Meet. You. That's cro -Magnus. Oh, they speak beautifully. Oh, forgive our condescension, friend. Oh no, don't brush that away so easily. Your incredulity at these sudden cave people speaking the same language as you is perfectly understandable. It is also f***ing implausible to the point of being impossible. The, the betterman. Better man? Betterman. Emphasis on the better. Well, I'm saying they won't grow to come in, but he can't be a better man. Also, movie beats its audience over the head like a caveman with a joke-shaped club. Oh. Whoa, what is Sandy's hair made of? According to this outline, it punched a hole clean through this wooden door. What is this? Uh, we call that a window. Window. Windows, especially Windows 2000 BC, would have most certainly had some sort of webbing or lattice to keep animals out. Otherwise, that sky is going to turn into a whole different blue screen of death. Mom, maybe we should drill some air holes in the door of the panic cubby? No air holes. Snakes could get in. Jeez, Hope. Dawn said air hole, not glory hole. I'm afraid we have one house rule here. We don't eat the bananas. What is the point of this rule, other than some stupid plot device that will create unnecessary conflict later in the movie? And Grug never asks why. And also, why doesn't Phil collect the bananas and make sure they don't get eaten? Actually, everyone gets their own rooms. I get that the movie wants to show how opposite the two families are, but there's no practical reason for the Bettermans to have that many spare bedrooms. If you ever encounter someone who is this prepared for seven guests with absolutely zero notice, you get the hell out of there as fast as you can. We get separate rooms! What's a room? What's a separate? I can understand Eep knowing the word room, but not understanding it when heard in this context. I have a harder time, however, accepting that Thunk, who has demonstrated a solid grasp of the English language, would be stumped by a relatively basic word like separate. If you give this place a chance, you might actually like it here. But have you been asked if you can stay? There's a lot of assuming going on here. <laughs> That's right, not assume, because honestly, you're just making an ass out of you. Leave me out of this mess. How is this family able to maintain all this wealth with just one kid? And for that matter, how have neither of these families gone full dugger, considering I haven't seen any prehistoric birth control? Look, show me a diaphragm made out of an eggshell, or a condom made out of a banana peel, or I'm left to believe all of you stopped having sex. <laughs> stopped having sex. How exactly is this water steaming? We've just seen a montage of various Rube Goldberg-like contraptions that assist the Bettermans with day-to-day -day living. Why hold out on the science behind this marvel? Couldn't sleep last night. Me neither. When I woke up, your mom was missing. So, could you actually sleep last night or not? And Thunk just stares at that box. Wait, did the birds bring their own entire tree? Because this branch was not there last night. Now that's how you make a fire. You don't need two people anymore. Actually, you never needed two people with your original method of fire making. If anything, Eep's assistant slowed you down. I'm fine with Guy being impressed with this new technology, but is it so much to ask that the praise be based on facts? Also, where did they get this giant matchstick from? Did we stumble into a Jack and the Beanstalk crossover? At this point, I wouldn't even be surprised. You smell different. Like, 
river rocks with a hint of moss. I highly doubt she smells as nice as river rocks and moss. Probably more like animal skins and death. Oh man, is this your ride? Nah, it's my dad's. The chunky being presented as an analog for a muscle car does not sufficiently explain the close-up of this animal tightening its butt cheeks. We were just checking out this invention. W what's it for? Um, it, w you know, why don't you ask Phil? He, he spends a lot of time in there. <sighs> I guess it isn't a true DreamWorks film if it isn't bashing the audience over the head with unsolicited toilet humor. Funny story. Everything you see before you used to be a sad, hopeless, dust-filled wasteland. That doesn't sound funny. Well, neither do half the jokes in this movie, but you don't see me pointing it out like some sort of asshole. I mean, except now, at a bunch of other points, but this is my job, damn it. Travel basket? Yeah, for the road. Hope's reference to metaphorical roads shouldn't exist because literal roads don't exist. A whole new world. A new fantastic point of view. I somewhat accept all of these made-up animals and concoctions, but I draw the line of the laws of physics being so loose that a giant cat could be trapped in honey and be suspended in the air. I have a scar. You have a scar! How the hell did she not know this thing was going through her hand? Also, scars and being stabbed are not mutually exclusive. I have a scar from falling off my bike when I was 12. My friend Randy has a scar from being stabbed during spring break. These are not the same. Don't tell Mrs. Betterman, but... While she thinks I'm toiling in the hot sun, I'm actually in here, my man cave. I ask again, how are the Bettermans able to maintain this massive farm? This would be an impossible task for two people, and now we discover that 50% of the workforce is down here steaming his man cave. Another shark milk? I hear you. How the hell does one milk a shark? The answer is carefully, and only when all other milkable options have been milked. I'm knocking on the door, big guy. Open it. Open up to me. Share with me. Aggressive therapy tactics. She's just like me. This is her cave. No, she's not like you. This is not her cave. She's not a cave girl. Cave girl? Whoa, Nelly. Aren't we a little early for that third act conflict cliche? Just because you've moved it to the halfway mark doesn't mean you escaped the sentence. Then I guess we have two different tomorrows. Hey, where is she keeping that rock? I don't see any pockets. <laughs> Jesus Christ, this asshole prematurely celebrates harder than NASA 69ing SpaceX. Also, why couldn't Phil just tell Grug about the reason for not touching the bananas? It's not the craziest story in the world, especially with wild-ass predators all over the f***ing place. I know Phil's a pretentious dick, but he's also pretty practical, right? Hey man, if this scene wants to truly Dark Knight Rises, it's missing a Deshi Basara chant. No sign of him. But I did find this, though. There's no way this basket should still be intact. And with the numerous wild animals in the area, there definitely shouldn't be any food left in it. Travel log. Literally, I'm traveling in a log. Thank you for once again spelling out the joke for us. Phew, I almost made it to the laughing part that time. Little update. Remember that tomorrow? You know, the one I spent my whole life looking for? Well, turns out the girl I love wants nothing to do with it. <sighs> or me! What is the point of this update? We know! We watched all this happen not even 15 minutes ago. You know, for an uncivilized cave girl, Leap's diary animations are a hell of a lot better than guys. It's over! over. Fine! Fine! Who cares? Not me. <laughs> I thought this was a split screen, but obviously it must be a rip in the fabric of space and time. Connecting Eep and Guy and allowing them to communicate. I mean, how else do you explain this argument being so perfectly in sync when they are nowhere near each other? Oh. <clears throat> this non-consensual de-rimming of someone else's fruit basket. Please, I'm good. It's in the past! You know, Guy and I, we're too different. Well, you and I are different, and we get along great, right? Despite all the other cheap gags this movie uses, it never goes for the trope of two female characters fighting over the male love interest. I appreciate this. Also, did she throw that picture back in time? It really feels like she threw that picture back in time. Yeah, yeah, but it's, it's, it's complicated. He's a boy. At the start of the film, Eep reminds us that meeting other people, especially boys, is extremely rare, and that she and Guy were the only two teenagers in the world. So how exactly is she in a position to start Eep explaining boys to Dawn? It wasn't so long ago that Eep was shocked to learn that another boy her age even existed. Well, in my day, we didn't have boy problems, because we didn't have any boys, or men, or clothes. Does biology work different in the Crudiverse? If there were no boys and men back in Grandma Crude's day, how did one make baby crudes? Oh, is there a diverse enough gene pool to sustain the species? Does this mean that Ugga and Grug are... Oh no! Well, there's gotta be another way, you know? Maybe one that's stable and not infested with land sharks! <laughs> land sharks? Come on, Hope. Are you even trying? These are obviously sharkodiles. Or shark gators or something. <laughs> land sharks indeed. Ah! 
I feel like the movie is trying to tell us that this huge mound of bananas in some way cushioned the impact of that 100-foot freefall. This means that the boomy acknowledges, quite rightly, that a fall of that nature would have resulted in a pulpy, grug guy, fill shaped mess on the floor. No movie, no amount of banana peels would have been sufficient to cushion that impact. Therefore, <clears throat> grug guy and Phil survived this. These geysers freezing instantly while everyone here seemed completely unaware of the temperature is an egregious denial of climate change. Getting away from these crazy cave people! Mom! You came barging into our lives uninvited without even wiping your disgusting feet and peeping thunk over here with his dumb window. These perfectly timed anti profana trees. Ah! Hope survives this. Guess you can't fault the movie for trying to keep hope alive, but you also can't fault me for dinging the sin bell either. Jesus Christ, that's terrifying! I get that the movie wants to teach kids things like not being scared and not judging a book by its cover, but it is more likely that anything you encounter in the wild with these attributes has the ability and instincts to kill you. I call bullshit on Grog not being able to squeeze through these bone bars, and even if he can't, Guy and Phil are like a quarter of his size, so surely they can. Teenagers! Are you ready to talk about it? Skip! This hurts so much. And I can't even see it. Hey, I said the same thing when I got my chlamydia diagnosis. I have a shawl to keep me warm. Disgust of wind is an asshole to hope. I mean, she deserves it, but the wind doesn't know that. Where's Guy? Wait, where did this sudden spotlight come from? Punch monkeys hadn't even mastered fire until Phil turned up, and now they've installed f***ing stage lighting? What's he saying, Guy? The aged wise one has decreed... <coughs> because we have no bananas for the monster, <coughs> you <coughs> will... This method of communication is inefficient and ridiculous. At some point, surely, the massive head trauma would have had to make you question the veracity of the information being communicated. How did it even come about? Thrown punch is usually the universal way of ending a conversation, not starting one. Also, did no one realize that this is probably not a great method of communication to promote in a children's movie? Matthew, why did you repeatedly pummel Joe in the face with that banana? Come on, sir, I was just saying you're like my best friend in Punch Monkey. Thunk! your thunk! Uh, I mean, what the thunk is thunk even doing in this movie? I'm sure the movie thinks he is here as comic relief. So far, all he's done is bite a baboon's ass and stare out of a window as if it's a TV. A joke that didn't land the first time, let alone after five callbacks. Why not have him trapped with Grug, Guy, and Phil? He can be equally unamusing there, but now we would have a powerful group of women rescuing all the male characters. That would have been awesome. The movie doesn't even attempt to explain where Deathcat got his boots of wall running. What in the name of Andy Circus was the point of slapping this yellow makeup on Guy here? If they were going to have to reapply it at this point. This is a total waste of resources. And you will never win the war for the planet of the Punch Monkeys with that sloppy attitude. Let's take a second to talk about the Punch Monkeys plan here. Sacrifice Grog Guy and Phil to the banana-loving monster by dressing them up to look like giant bananas in the hope that it will... What? Stop coming back for more bananas? Surely once the monster's eaten these guys, it'll just come back tomorrow for more, right? Also, isn't there a good chance that this banana disguise will immediately fall apart when the monster bites into the fleshy cave people and hits bone and muscle instead of a tasty, pulpy banana? Also, also, don't banana skins turn bad super f***ing quickly? Like, within minutes of being open? For the peels to be this fresh, the punch monkeys would have had to carefully peel the giant bananas, eat, throw away the precious banana interior, and then very quickly wrap up Grug, Guy, and Phil to disguise them as the very thing they just destroyed. Why not just feed the giant bananas to the monster in the first place? Really? A title card? This late into the movie? You might as well throw in some end of story narration while you're at it. Pack stays together. Bro. Bro? Bro. This could have been a heartfelt moment if the movie had even remotely earned it. Shared near-death experience in a banana coffin does not make you bros. Damn it, Krog! It was mere hours ago that Phil was volunteering you for a life of banana-picking servitude for the Punch Monkeys. What are they doing? I have the same question for the animators for their aesthetic choices at the very end of this movie. Yo, at this point, why is the big ape even chasing the humans? He very clearly ate the tiny monkeys earlier when the bananas ran out. I spent my whole life searching for a place called tomorrow, but it isn't a... Ah! Character chooses to profess feelings to love interest while both parties are still in clear and immediate danger cliché. In the name of Kevin McAllister, did all these vines come pre-laced with kerosene? Oh, all apart from this one? Of course. Wow, I can't believe that actually worked. You know what? I'm not even going to dignify that with an agreement. Just a... What impossible method of bullshit would allow this tiny little Portland peanut toe to cling onto Eep's foot while under the weight of a porcupine while... Also allowing for quick release severance when a life or death need arises. Screenwriter thinks teasing the sudden death of a pet is the best way to bring this movie down the home stretch. Boozies? And just like that, Eep was replaced the end. Here, look at the monkey. Look at the silly monkey. It's your dream. What are you gonna do? I gotta follow my own plan. You know, stay here. Get my own thing going. Travelogue. It's been 
A lot of moons. All the moons. Whose balls did I have to fondle to get my very own movie? I can't tell you, but it does rhyme with Pulverine. And let me tell you, he's got a nice pair of smooth criminals down under. With gapes patterned as vividly as this, the parents have no doubt about where to post their food parcels. Here's Johnny! Okay, go get it! No! I'm sorry! I'm yeah, there were horses and a man on fire, and I killed a guy with a trident. So, you come in here to hide from your family? That's what I do. I drink, and I know things. I said, put the bunny back in the box. It's 1933, and I'm a private eye. I like to drink egg creams, and I like to fight Nazis. Guy. Guy. I'm not your guy, buddy. He's not your buddy, friend. I'm not your friend, guy. Took Chucky for a joyride. Joyride? Joyride? Hey, candy cane. Because I was a slut. I slept with a whole bunch of people, a slew, a heap, a peck. Mostly guys. Mom!